It's time for another episode of Rolling Dice and Taking Names. A little squirrel told me that the guys will be previewing an upcoming Kickstarter game, Lawyer Up. They also review Agizia. And the guys will introduce their first train game segment with Age of Steam. The little squirrel also said, these guys are nuts. Hey, y'all, and welcome to the 191st episode of RDTN. My name is Marty. And I'm Tony. This episode is called Long Train Running by a group I used to love listening to growing up, the Doobie Brothers. Did you get into the Doobie Brothers, Tony? No, not so much. I mean, oh. I, I, I heard some, you know, I, I heard their songs, enjoyed some of their songs, but I didn't get into them. I mean, it wasn't one of those that I'd want to go see in concert. And that's one of the things I kind of measure or certain artists by when I think I would have really liked to have seen them in concert. So me asking you whether you liked pre-Michael McDonald doobies or post-Michael McDonald would mean nothing to you. No, it would mean absolutely nothing to me. Okay. So that just killed that. that so the intro's done. Let's get to some <laughs> games. Sheesh. <laughs> well, so much for that discussion. Oh, and for good measure, uh, I think the pre-Michael McDonald era is probably good, solid rock. However, Michael McDonald has an amazing voice, a fantastic blues voice and he went on to do some incredible solo stuff over his career so as a singer he's amazing i'm with you there now marty i'm still in the hotel <sighs> tony weren't you supposed to be out of the hotel by now i was supposed to but you know when you're building a house if you've ever done new construction it's like the house suddenly rises from the ashes or from the dirt and you know things are moving so far so fast so furious everything's going right along fast you know, and the, furious you might fast say and furious. yes that's number nine coming out i saw that ad on the super bowl we're going to talk about that in a second but go ahead but when you get down to the final stages the painting the cleaning the final little steps it just takes a while Mm -hmm. They over-anticipated how long that stage would take on the painting. They were estimating a day. It took seven. So that's why I'm having to um, stay in the hotel a little bit more. But we are recording on a Monday night again, and it's free wine. The Moscato is <laughs> flowing, baby. Here we go. Oh, Lord. And we're going to be talking about some uh, more of a heavier game, so I hope we can get through this. And for those who may not know what we're talking about, Tony actually had to move out of his house. His house had to have some repairs. The manufacturer had messed up a few things, and so in the process of fixing it, and he's living in a residence inn right now, and we thought that uh, he would be back in and move back in this Saturday. In fact, I wish we would have known the schedule ahead of time because then, Tony, you could have gone with me to Tantrum Con. I could have, and I wanted to, but I said, so when we found out that we weren't moving in, I was like, mm, I really need to. And Donna's like, no, we need to go do another walkthrough because we were going to see my mom on Sunday, so I needed to do another walkthrough of the house to highlight any issues that we might have as we finish out the closeout before we turn the house over. So I hate I missed Tantrum Con. I saw some great pictures. I saw a picture where people were held hostage at Ragusa, but other than that, it oh. looked like a lot of a lot of fun. Oh, please. Yeah. So while I was at uh, Tantrum Con, uh, we had this event where I taught people Ragusa. This was a scheduled event where people could sign up. And on Saturday morning, Michael, Mark, Brad, and Alex all joined me. And I sat them and talked in the game. None of them had ever played before. So I was already kind of worried. It's like, great. Now I, I got to totally teach the game again and not screw up. And I still screwed up a small rule. It wasn't devastating i just didn't explain something exactly right with the wall for some reason i can't get the wall rules right when it comes to scoring but anyway it's like you hit a wall when you do that explanation right oh that's very colorful language right there very allegorical metaphorical simile sure so you you know <laughs> watch it played responded did you teach him the rules again and was there any issues because last time you taught mr rodney smith you taught him a rule wrong but this one did not impact the outcome of the game it did not impact the outcome of the game and everybody really enjoyed the game and after it was over there's like okay we don't understand why tony doesn't really get into this game because they all really enjoyed it that's the first time i had played with five players tony and i thought holy crap this board is going to be crowded and holy crap, was that board crowded, but it made some, for some really tense moments because mm -hmm. at the, at the end of the game, everybody was fighting over spots and where they could go and everything. And, and, uh, it was actually a, a pleasure playing with Brad's daughter, Alex, who is a sophomore in high school, who was on an engineering path. And Tony, oh, cool. I, I told her after the game, 
I could see the engineering mind working. She just got this game and it just clicked for her. And she's like, well, I need to go here so I can get these resources here. So I can go over here and activate this. And get I mean, she's like, dig, 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 dig. I told her afterward, I said, all right, you are for sure going to be an engineer because it just really clicked for her. So it was really cool to see her get into it. Did you convince her that we need more power engineers, electrical engineers? So I asked her which discipline she's thinking about. And she's considering either electrical or mechanical. And I told her, you can't go wrong with either one. Uh, no, you can't. I mean, we just... We need more females in the industry. We need more engineers regardless. Yes. Uh, STEMs, people. Do the STEMs. We need people in engineering and technology. And I will tell you right now, it pays well. When you come out of college, oh, Tony, you, you hire people right out of college too. It pays pretty darn well, doesn't it? Uh, yes, it does. Um, a lot better than what you and I got paid coming out of college, but that was a long time ago. Yeah, we won't talk about that because it's our birthday week and I don't want to be reminded of that. Oh, yeah. By the way, happy birthday. Oh, oh, thank you. And happy birthday to you, too. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And, you know, just uh, like someone put in our pod pledge channel, um, another trip around the sun. Got to keep it going. Keep yeah. it going, baby. Now, before we, we move away from Tantrum Con, because I, I will forget, because that's what happens when you have birthdays. You tend to forget things. Uh, an amazing show. Tony, you got to go last year, and it was just as an amazing event as what it was in the past. They're going to have to expand. The open gaming area was totally packed. They had a bigger vendor area this time. So they, they told me they're going to have to just kind of decide how to change the layout for next year. They had a good place for snacks. Uh, it was just well run. There were helpers all over the place to, to help you with whatever needs that you had. If you are ever in the Greenville area during uh, January, early February, you check this out. If you're not, make a trip because it's worth coming to. It is a good three-day con. I'm not sure how many people go three to 400, four to 500. It's in that ballpark. So it's a very quaint con. They have a good library. They have a lot of events going on. I had a blast and hopefully you can go next year, Tony. Oh, I plan on it. It'll be on the calendar. Now, if you know, if something comes up storm related or anything like that may not be able to, but I, my intent is to go because I mean, my heavens, you get to see some great people down there, get to see, you know, from the Carolinas. We have a big time last time. Matter of fact, I understand. Didn't you play Sorcerer City with one of our listeners? Uh, I did not. Oh, I thought you did. I was thinking, I'm sorry. I, maybe I misunderstood the Instagram. Yes. A, a lady who is, who had listens to our show, who lives here locally in Charlotte, uh, was interested in Sorcerer City. She had a chance to play it, but I didn't get to sit with her while she played. She played at the table beside me as I was ah. teaching Ragusa. And uh, Derek from Board Game Resolution was there and, and taught her Sorcerer City. And she said it was a little too mathy, too crunchy for her, but uh, her son really enjoyed it. And shoot, we played that game again last week, Tony. It was one of those things that you didn't get to go to game night last week. And the guy said, uh, could you bring Sorcerer City again? I went, sure can. That's that's become a hit in our group. Is it speeding up? Because, you know, when we talked about we said there was that two minute, place the tiles down, and then boom, you hit a major speed bump. Is it speeding up? Yes, it did. But you had two new people playing. You had uh, Fred Jr. and Barney <laughs> Sr. playing. We had Proxy Fred and Proxy Barney. Right. It uh, it still flowed pretty well. There wasn't a lot of a AP going on. And it's just a solid game. I had a, I had a little mechanic to where uh, the one of the first tiles, like you could play a game where you have an artifact tile that you get, get at the beginning of the game and you could pick one to keep. I happened to pick one that said kill a monster. So monsters never mess me up at all. I always got lucky where uh, a monster would come out and then I had the kill a monster tile come out later in order to get rid of it. So that was an issue for me. I had a good uh, mechanism of generating a lot of magic. I, I didn't win, but I feel like I, the more I play, the better I get. So do you remember which monsters you had? I do not. Okay, you, you said it wasn't obviously Gelatinous Cube or the Dragon. Again. I actually made sure to pick new ones. Genie okay. was one of them. I do remember Genie. Okay. That is the only one that, that I remember. Okay, maybe Major Nelson. Do, 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 do. Okay, we just really dated ourselves and people are like, what the heck are you people talking about? Larry Hagman and Barbara Eden in the 60s. Go check it out. We watched it as kids as reruns. Which can easily transition into the Super Bowl halftime event. For those <laughs> oh of you gosh. for those of you who don't watch the sports ball, um, understand you probably missed a very interesting Super Bowl. I'm not going to get into the debates that are going on in the uh, interwebs and all that other garbage that's, that's happening out there. It was not what I thought it would be, that's for sure. It is so funny, the debates and people are like, I didn't see the Super Bowl, so what are you talking about? So it was uh, Shakira 
and uh, Jennifer Lopez were the halftime shows. Two amazing, amazing artists. Come on. Yeah, singers and dancers. And yes. I think the thing was a lot of things that they, they were dancing and it was the typical type of modern dance and they were wearing, I don't know if skimpy is the right word. I mean, everything was covered and everything. It was almost like, you know, there's, there's, you see more on the beach, but anyway, so there was this whole debate of like, was it appropriate? Was it inappropriate and stuff? I think that's left up to the person. If they didn't want to watch, they didn't have to watch. And if they enjoyed it, they enjoyed it. It was so funny though. It was afterwards. I was talking to somebody about it. I said, I thought it was a fine show. I said, the thing is, was I, I don't listen to either one of their songs. And I saw, I said, I'm not really in their demographic. And then it hit me really hard that, wait a minute, Jennifer Lopez is 50 years old. It is my demographic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Shakira is 43 ish. Two or three ish. Yeah. That's so right. I didn't, I did not realize that Jennifer Lopez was 50. And then I look, it's like, wow. Um, I have really let myself go to compare to these artists who keep themselves uh, in shape to be able to do dance moves like that. Speaking of aging. Well, yes. Another commercial. I mean, it's not saying how far he has fallen, but for QT 79 year old Chuck Norris. And no, we're not talking the game. We're talking commercials because that's why I watched the Super Bowl. Yeah. So it was funny. I actually saw that when we went to Mega Moose Con. No, was it Mega Moose? I can't remember what it was. Our family stopped at a QT and uh, we saw his like picture on the side of the building and we knew he was going to be like kind of the spokesperson for them. And so he has a commercial that came out. And that com commercial was just bad. It was just bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what commercials did you like? There's three that stand out to me. Well, Walmart. The Walmart with all the different spaceships and sci-fi stuff uh, coming yeah. into play. They had done something like that before, but now they brought in a, a lot of other uh, licenses. It's like, that had to cost them a fortune to get those mm -hmm. licenses on that commercial. Yeah, that one uh, stood out the most to me. And then the rest of them were kind of just like, eh. What about Rocket Mortgage with Jason Momoa? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I did forget that one. That one was hilarious. Matter of fact, the whole room was laughing when that happened. Oh, I was hurting. Jason Momoa is a good comedic actor, and he really showed his uh, acting strokes right there. And I didn't realize that I had totally forgotten at the end. He's married to Lisa Bonet. Oh, me too. I had forgotten that as well. And I was like, that's Lisa Bonet. Now, is he a wrestler? No, he's an actor. He was Aquaman. I know he was Aquaman. I thought he was. Uh, there's somebody in one of the wrestling groups. Now I'm, people are yelling at The Rock, Dwayne Johnson. Johnson? No, there's someone else in the thing. Never John mind. Cena? You're now you're dating yourself. It's now going on now. John Cena is a current actor. Rock's current actor. No, no, no. They're in the wrestling arena now. I stopped watching wrestling a long time ago. Okay. And I mean, and then Ric Flair was in one of the commercials. Woo! I can't remember what commercial it was. What's the other commercial? Now, I am into um, running gags. So the one with uh, Tide, mm -hmm. where the guy got a stain on his shirt and he kept showing up in all the other commercials, that was just laughing really hard at that one. Yeah, I wasn't quite getting it, and then I got it. I was like, oh, there, I see what they're doing here. I can't believe all these people are, are they all owned by the same company? I, you know, that just. I don't think so. I don't know if Bud Light owns Tide. I mean, that's Procter & Gamble, unless they're, again, it was just a really good uh, collaboration between uh, different companies. And then I hope you saw the Groundhog Day commercial uh, for Jeep. No, I missed that one. <gasps> okay, I'm not spoiling anything. Tony, when we get off here, go look up uh, Jeep on YouTube and look at their Super Bowl commercial. And make okay. sure to watch the extended version. It's like a, a minute 45. The one that was on TV was a short version. Okay, I will go do that. And now, especially, we left the uh, Super Bowl watching around the nine-minute mark in the fourth quarter. So you missed the comeback. Yes. <laughs> I got back into the hotel. We turned it on. I'm like, what the? Yep. Oh, holy cow. So, oh, well, so much for that. Time to move forward. Did we play any games? Oh, before I forget, see, I squirreled earlier, and it's coming back to me because we mentioned movie Fast and Furious 9. Is that not the most insane? I mean, how ridiculous are they getting now? I caught a glimpse of that one when something shot and grabbed a tire or something to keep <laughs> it from falling. What? <laughs> what the, what, this is, <laughs> I'm like, it is, I was laughing. A car shoots off the end of, a, or it goes off the end of a cliff, mm -hmm. somehow catches a cable. No, the cable shoots them and grabs it like a grappling hook, I thought. Oh, yeah, yeah, and then as the car is falling, it ends up taking the momentum of the car and swinging the car back around onto the cliff. And I'm like, are you kidding me? It's not even suspend belief in you. They're not even asking you to suspend. Just like, you know, this is ridiculous, but you're going to come pay us millions of dollars to watch it anyway. Oh, yeah. 
how much more fast and furious can we go? Uh, uh, as long as it keeps making money, and you know every year that we do our summer movie thing, whoever picks Fast and Furious is guaranteed to make $100 million on that movie. Guaranteed. At least. At least. Unreal. That's low. Mm -hmm. So when we have our big movie picks this year, uh, Fast and Furious 9 is going to be for sure be on my list. Well, you put it on your list. I think I get first pick. No, I won. That's right. I won. Yes, you won. You get last pick, my friend. Oh, so actually, I'll get fast but that's a good spot though, because you get two picks in a row. Okay. So now we'll swing back to games. So I'm glad I had a day where I could just sit and watch TV on Sunday and watch the Super Bowl because on Saturday while at Tantrum Con, I played On Mars. Oh yeah, really? Oh yeah, the new Vitale Lacerda game from Eagle Griffin Games. I love his games. I love uh, Kanban and Gallerist. Uh, he made Lisboa. And so I was very interested to play it. I heard a lot of things about it. I heard it was a little bit heavier than some of his other games. And boy, oh boy, was it heavier than some of his other games. I sat down and played with Pete Shirey from Come On and Kevin from uh, Tantrum House, which is really cool. I never get to sit and play games with them because they're so busy at cons. But it was really cool to sit down and actually play a game. And we sat down and played this beast. It took us two and a half hours, two and a half, three hours. But 30 minutes of that was learning the game. Mm -hmm. And Tony, it, it may have been a while since you've played a Lacerda game. What's, do you remember the last one that you played by chance? I'll have to do a quick a Google search or Board Game Geek. Did you play Gallerist? No, you didn't let me play that. You didn't play Los Boa either, did you? You wouldn't let me play that. <laughs> so Kanban's probably the last one that you played. You didn't let me play that. You never played Kanban? No. You so hold on. Me. My gosh, I am sorry, dude. You've never played a Lacerda game. No, you, you said it was too much for me to handle. You know what? Probably is because after this game was <laughs> over, Kevin said, do you think Tony would like this? And I went, probably not. <laughs> So, but, but you may, here's the thing. His games have this, have this thing. Most they're, they're mainly kind of like worker placement games. So mm -hmm. you, you simple concept of a worker, you place a worker, you take an action, right? Right. His thing puts that on steroids to where I'm just going to use on Mars as an example. So on Mars is you have actions that you can do on Mars. You can have actions you can do when you're orbiting around Mars. Each one has five actions, separate actions. He has this really cool thing to where, let's say I'm on Mars and I take one of my workers and I do an action. This action may let me um, allow me to take a rover and move on a board to cross a tech tile which lets me advance tech that I have collected over the course of the game. And as I advance tech, when I cover a space, it may let me take an action that might be available if I was in orbit, but not on the planet. So there's this huge combo mechanism of, well, I'm going to take this action that lets me do this. That ends up letting me taking this other action that is going to let me do this. That ends up letting me taking this other action. So instead of like, well, sure, I can take a worker and do that. But if you do it effectively, you might be able to take multiple actions per turn. And that's what really turns his games into a brain burner mm -hmm. is being mm -hmm. able to pull off stuff like that. So while there may be actions I need to do in space, if I do it correctly, I might be able to activate those same actions while on the planet and vice versa. That's the way the gallerist was. It's the way Kanban is. It's that same sort of thing. Well, here's 10 basic actions you can do. Now we're going to really ramp it up because there's multiple ways to actually potentially do those actions. So you told me three hours to play, 30 minutes of learning, so two and a half hours. I can handle a two and a half hour game. Okay. Hopefully somebody around here has a copy because now that I've played it, boy, maybe should you start with On Mars? <laughs> maybe you should start with something less than that. No. Kanban might be good. Hey, I'm a pro. I'm a pro. You are a pro. So why don't you just go out there and order up a copy? <laughs> well, here's the thing. You can't, you can't get them. Is that what you're telling no, me? No, it's, it's brand new. You, you can get it. And it's an incredible production from Eagle Griffin Games. They have custom inserts and everything. Eagle Griffin makes an incredible game. And actually, we're going to be doing a deep dive on one of their games later in the episode, which is why we call it Long Trade Running, hint, hint. But they did an amazing job on the production. It looks it looks really good. But it's one of those things that I have Gallerist, I have Kanban, I have Lisboa. I don't know that I need On Mars because if I want to play one of his games, those others are a little bit less crunchy. And I think I'll like a tad less crunch because I feel like every time I went to play on Mars, I would kind of have to relearn everything again. Mm -hmm. And again, I, it's an amazing game. After all, we're all said and done said, I don't know how he comes up with designs like this. I don't know how somebody's brain comes up with something 
so intricate and it just works like a well-oiled machine. It just all works so well together, but there's just a lot to keep up with as you're playing the game. That was on Mars. I'm so glad I got a chance to experience it. And one of Pete's friends taught us the game and, and big thanks to him for teaching us. He did a great job teaching, by the way, an amazing job. One of the best uh, teachings that I've, I've ever had was somebody, something, a game so complicated. And okay. he was so good as we played the game. He would say, by the way, you can do this. You can't do that. He would catch things that maybe we screwed up. Good experience. It was a good you. experience. I am so glad I got to play it. So glad. I enjoy enjoy his designs. Did you make it to the flea market? Uh, yes, I did. I uh, got to the flea market and uh, sold a few games so I could make space on the shelves for potentially more games later on down the road. Because, you know, 3,000 games come out per year. You know, my birthday's coming up. Did you buy me a present? Speaking of birthdays. Yeah, nice transition. I got to... <laughs> <laughs> I got to, uh, I had a, a great birthday with my family. Uh, Vanessa did an amazing job putting together a little party. It was just my family and my parents. I pulled a game off the shelf that I have not played in a while. And you know how sometimes you have those gems you just forget about? And then you pull it off the shelf and go, dang, I forgot how good this was. That's what happened when I pulled out Downforce from Restoration Games mm -hmm. and taught my parents, man, that is a good game. It is. Or Flam Rouge, but Downforce. You enjoyed Downforce again. Yeah. The reason, and I, I was trying to decide between the two. And the reason why I want to pick something like that, because thematically they both make sense. We're just racing. Mm -hmm. Downforce plays up to five. No, it plays up to six. And that's how many people we had. I've never played with six, and I love it because everybody gets one car, as opposed to if you play with five, one person will have two cars and one will have four. So I just liked it better like this. I, I did have a tough time explaining to my parents this whole betting mechanism. And that even though your car may not come in first, you still may win because you may have bet on the correct car. But in the end, it didn't matter because dad beat all of us. He came in first in betting and first with his car. So there you go. I must have been a good teacher on that game. Were all the boys home? No. It, uh, Travis was at school. Travis was at school. Okay. So you were looking at six, which is a which is a difficult number sometimes to find a good game for. Uh, yes, it is. In fact, I, I know every once in a while that you look for games that go up to what, six or seven? Six, yeah. And I, we actually um, last weekend played Sagrada again again yes the six player and it drug a little bit it was a good game we were all tight everybody remembered the rules so i was very happy with that donna did have an issue with one of her dice placements but that's okay that's all right we had to correct that and she suffered the penalty sort of kinda sagrada you and i need to play that sometime too another game Another game that we need to play. And that's actually one of those Vanessa has seen you post that and she keeps going, why haven't we played that? And I go, because Tony won't let me borrow it. You can borrow it anytime. <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, speaking of a game for six, I got one for you that you've been waiting on. And I brought it home so that we can play it and then you might like it with your friends and family. While I was at Tantrum Con, everything goes back to Tantrum Con. Elf Creek Games was there. Oh, baby. Dude, I got us a copy yes. of Atlantis Rising. I know what we're playing this week. Yep, I agree. I, I think we should. I picked up the neoprene mat for you Woo! and the deluxe bits. Oh, I'm excited. Mr. Rodney Smith has already done a video for it. So it's actually, I watched it. It's it's a pretty straightforward game. It's yeah. not it's not a hard game to learn. So I thought you would be excited about that. So maybe we can when we get together this week, we can play. I hope so. Man, Tantrum Com did you right. Yeah, Tantrum Con was sweet. And I really love Elf Creek games, man. That Honey Buzz game, I am so excited about that. And they were telling me about a yet another game uh, that they haven't announced yet that's going to be coming out that sounds really cool, too. It's going to be a Kickstarter later on this year. So if y'all aren't following Elf Creek games, please do so. That's one of those young publishing companies that's really up and coming. And at the Atlantis Rising, you know, it was a reprint. Uh, Honey Buzz is a brand new game that people Gorgeous. are just so excited about. Gorgeous looking game. Mm. Yes, it is. And he was telling me about the production values and the little things. They were doing like little squishy cubes for the honey. So they're not hard. Oh. They actually have a little <laughs> squish to them. So <laughs> they're really going all out. And Atlantis Rising on the table just looks amazing it's so colorful the the graphic art and everything just looks really good i cannot wait to play it it may be one of those things you know it's it's kind of like pandemic ish it's a co-op game so i really can't wait to compare it to a pandemic very excited about that so you didn't play anything else i did i went to my mom's on sunday and we played um phase 10 remember my my aunt and uncle and my mother are in their mid-70s that's rodney smith's favorite game sarcasm i was getting ready to say not nah, sarcasm 
Big time. Donna knows that that is one of the card games that I do not enjoy. It's a game that a lot of people enjoy it. That's fine. This is not a game for me, but I got to go pick and I'm tired of having to play five crowns again and again and again. And my mom only had um, face 10. I bought her six nymph, but I always have to reteach that and it never goes well. Yeah. So we played phase 10. I won. We started at 1.30. Guess what time we finished? And it's a five person. You can play up to six, but we had five playing. I would hope no more than an hour. Three and a half hours. How? Have you never played it? No. Okay. Do you even know the concept of it? I've totally forgot. I at one time heard the concept, but I've never played. Okay. And, I, and I saw the rules, but I forgot. There are 10 phases in the game. So in the first phase, you need to have two sets of three. You're dealt 10 cards. And when you do that, you put them on the table. And then whoever, and so you've got your, you've melded, you're down. And then as other players play, but when other players play, they can also add to your sets. Let's say you had three sets of three on phase, the first phase. That's illegal. You can't do that. You can only have two sets of three. During each round, you, when you, whoever goes out first, that's the winner or that's the rounds over. You play again. Everybody who completed the first phase can now advance to the second phase, which is a run of uh, four and a set of three, I think is how it is. I don't know. can't remember all of them. But you keep doing that progression. Whenever you go down, you go to the next phase when the next round begins. And there's 10 of them. Some of them are ridiculous. And if you don't progress, then you could possibly go out while other people are trying to do, oh, I don't know, a run of seven, a run of eight, a run of nine. And the worst one is a set of two sets of four, which is, of course, collecting eight cards that are the same or a set that are the same and another set that's the same number. That is the worst. And it takes forever because whoever can make it to the final phase 10 and go down is the winner of the game. I know how you are at a table with long games. How did you not claw your eyes out while you're doing this? Since I'm in the hotel, we were doing laundry. Okay. Every time I'd go check on the laundry or I'd go get, now my mom had a box of moon pies. Okay, good. All right. And then my aunt brought over a whole uh, uh, golden uh, Hershey's golden nugget tin that she picked up. And then, of course, we um, had some snacks around the table. So it was good. The Diet Cokes were flowing. You know, things were just happening. It was family. We were talking. We were conversing. We were having a good time. So, yeah, phase 10, it took a while. Oh, by the way, if you don't go out, you have to total your cards and the scorekeeper writes them down and I'm the scorekeeper. But guess what? The points only matter if two people go out on phase 10, then the points matter. Other than that, they're useless. So what I'm hearing is, is we've probably talked more about phase 10 than any other show on, in the hobby board gaming space. I'm thinking right now, I would say never play it with five, play it maybe with three or four. How about never play it at all? Sounds like phase 10. I mean, it's a good card game. It's a good conversation game. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> I'm just telling you, it's one of my wife's favorite games. Speaking of uh, Moon Pies, one thing I forgot to mention, Mike from Elf Creek Games on his way down from Chicago stopped into a uh, store and saw Moon Pies and decided to get one. And he said, I did not know there was this thing called salted caramel. And I said, and what did you think? He said, that was one of the most amazing things I've ever had. So help me to rem uh, remember, Tony, next time we go to Gen Con, well, they will have a booth this year selling hopefully Excellent. Honey Buzz. We need to pay take him salted caramel moon pies. Caramel caramel. Which one? Which is it? I always say caramel. Do you say caramel? That's a place in Indianapolis near Gen Con. Oh, oh, oh man, I need to, we need to move forward, but I didn't tell you this. Uh, I was at a meeting down while I missed game night. I had a meeting in Orlando with uh, some teammates from Duke. And one of the ladies who's on the team with me, she knows I do games. And she goes, do you need a place at Gen Con? And I go, uh, yeah. Yes. And she goes, oh, my friend has a condo that she rents out. And it sits right across from the spaghetti warehouse. Excuse me? I went, excuse, yeah, I went, excuse me? And I got my high voice going. And she's like, yeah, well, let me see if it's still available. So wait a minute, you're telling me this, and yet you don't know if it's available. She goes, nobody's booked it this early. Oh, please. I'm like, it's gone. There's no way it's available. And they had just started renting it out. Okay. 
So 2021, let's go ahead and hit this person up early and see what these rates are. Already done. Good. It's a three bedroom place. It sits right there over the space above the warehouse. It's a little condo. I'm good. We're golden 2021. So there you go. See, look how that networking pans out. I just happen to be, as we're recording, we're recording on Hangouts and Tony is sitting in his hotel room and he has a little mini kitchen behind him. This would have been perfect for your little hotel. If you have one, if not, you need to get one. Do you have an Instapot? No, I do not have an Instapot yet. So I was like, what is the big deal? Well, Target had a big sale on one. Mm -hmm. and, and then we had to like, uh, if you use your red card, get an extra 10% off. So we went and said, fine, we'll go get an Instapot because we were wanting to do a um, pulled pork butt. Typically the way we do pulled pork is you put it in a pot of boiling water and it sits there for four hours to tenderize it. You pull it off, add barbecue sauce, yum, yum. So we went and got a, an Instapot and we looked at the instructions. We said, this, this can't be right. Oh yeah. We cooked an eight pound pork butt in two hours hours we cut the time in half and it just literally fell off the bone when we took it out of the pot so the next night we said all right what else can we throw in this thing and it was like oh this thing does rice and we typically because we just don't want to wait on it we typically get like bag rice that takes mm -hmm. you know five or ten minutes to make and Vanessa said, wait a minute, we got the, the real rice that takes like, you know, 20 to 30 minutes to make. And I looked it up on here and I said, this can't be right. Let's try it. Pour in some water, pour in some rice, seal it up, set the timer for four minutes. And in four minutes, we had amazing moist rice. Didn't stick, didn't stick to the bottom of the pot. Instapot is like magic, man. It's magic. So let me guess, you've never had a pressure cooker. Years ago, I don't have one now, but the beauty of this, this is an intelligent pressure cooker. Yes. Because you can have high pressure, you can have low pressure, it's a slow cooker. Basically, you just kind of program it to what you want it to do. It builds up pressure. Once it builds up, it regulates it and then clicks on the timer and just and just starts going. Next thing I want to throw in is grits. Cause grits are hard to do too, but there's so many things you could throw. You could steam vegetables. I'm just in love. And then there was this other thing that's beside of it. That's going to be the next purchase. You know what it is? Air, air fryer. fryer. Now I have my air fryer. Is it worth getting? Uh, how often, I mean, you're a health conscious kind of guy. So how often do you do tater tots or veggie tots? Well, whenever we do like fries or tater tots, we always put them in the oven. We never really fry them in oil. So an air fryer is like having them in a oil fryer. They're amazing. They take less time. They're, they're crisp. They're hot. They're cooked perfectly. They're not burned. You don't have to sit there and shake the pan to hope you rotate them. We've done chicken tenders. Oh, my favorite is um, asparagus or broccoli in it. Yep. Because it's like grilling it. I love my air fryer. What can I say? Yeah. See, I've been trying to talk myself into an Instapot, but I just haven't done it yet. Well, look for sales. We got it for like uh, $70. Okay. So uh, it's a six quart, easy to clean, it's easy to set up. And, and I'm standing. Look, I know we need to move on to another segment, but there's one of the game we want to talk about that uh, we had a chance to prototype. And that is a game that was introduced last year at Essen for Mark Manor Games. It's called Lawyer Up. And they reached out to us and said, would you guys like to check out a prototype of this? And, and Tony, you and I rarely do prototypes, but this one sounded interesting because it's a two player game where one of you is the prosecution and one of you is the defense. And you're basically trying to win over the jurors to your side. And this is done through some really clever card play. Yes, uh, surprising. I'm like, when you were explaining this to me, I was like, oh, really? It's, you know, yeah, it sounds like a deck builder. Let's see how this thing goes. And I was like, hmm, kind of questioning. Like, really? Is this, it was this as good as you made it seem? You, you were selling it really well. I was trying to. So we got to sit down and play it. Everything about it feels like a court case. The very first thing you do is you gather evidence, which is basically a card drafting mechanic at that time. Each of you were going to get three cards. You're going to keep one. You're going to give one to the other person and discard one. So you could be helping yourself out. You could be doing something to hurt the other person. And during this time, you know who's going to be prosecutor and who's going to be defender. And you're trying to build up your case. These cards are like evidence cards or uh, other cards that have d uh, special abilities that you're going to play over the course of the game. And once you have a deck of cards, then 
depending on the case that you have, you're going to have witnesses that are going to come out. This is what's really cool. We only had one case to play, but the idea is you're going to have different cases with different scenarios and different stories and different setups. In our case, we had like nine witnesses and one at a time, you're going to call a witness. And when you call a witness, it comes out to the middle of the table and they have these icons on either side of the card. One side's facing the prosecution, one side's facing the defense. And the whole goal is try to gain influence over this witness and take them over to your side. And that's done through card play. You must play a card that has an icon that matches one of the cards that you just played. Can I just stop you just for a minute? Cause normally you do a great job on explaining rules way better than I. That's why I always make you do it, but you're not trying to influence the witness. You're trying to win the witness. Sorry. You're trying to make the witness look credible towards your defense or prosecution so that you can influence the jury's decision because by winning that witness or making them seem credible towards your case, you then influence the jury and to help you gain the winning requirements. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Because as you're playing cards, these cards have values on them. They could have a positive influence towards the prosecution, a positive influence towards the defense or neutral influence. And you keep playing cards till both of you pass. If you're playing prosecution, you're going to count up all the prosecution numbers on your side. I'll count up the defense. Whoever has the highest wins that witness. And then you take that witness to your side. Now the witness may have some winning conditions. It may be, Hey, if you win me, you get to do something special. The last card that you played may be activated. It says, Hey, if you happen to win this witness, you get this victory condition here. But the whole goal is you're taking the influence that you just gained and it's, and you compare the two and take a difference. So if you had nine and I had five, you would have four influence that you could spend on affecting the jurors mm -hmm. and there's 10 jurors out there. Five of them start biased towards the prosecution. Five start biased towards the defense. Are you sure it's 10 and not 12? Yes. I'm sorry. But half of them are influenced towards the defense. Half of them are influenced towards the prosecution. The influence that you just gained can now be used to modify the influence. So if somebody's influenced towards my side, uh, there's an influence value on the witness card that says you, you must exceed this amount. And if you can, there's a token that you slide towards your side. So the influence has four spaces on it, two for prosecution, two for defense, and you slide back and forth. So it's a tug of war over influence of each of these jurors that's going over the entire course of the game. And you're going to rinse and repeat basically through every single witness. And at the mm -hmm. very end, in the case that we were playing, the prosecution wins if every juror is biased towards the prosecution, but all it takes Tony is for you to win as the defense is just have one juror on your side and the defense wins the case. There you go. Hung jury. And, and I'm, I apologize again, Marty, but you know, cause the reason why I bring it up is because everybody's like, there's not 10 wit, uh, 10 jurors. There's 12. And yes, there were 12 locking a juror. That was interesting. I found playing as the defense. I know I just mentioned something. I'm not explaining it, but that's okay. Y'all are used to that crap. When you lock a juror, basically, as Marty did to me numerous times. Only the prosecution can lock a juror. Right. Yes. Mar right. Can lock them. In other words, he has solidly convinced them that he is right. He has influenced their decision. The only way I could unlock them is if I had a special card that would allow me to do that or if a witness allowed me to do that. So that's one of those things that, cause you're probably sitting there thinking this game would go on for, it'd be like phase 10. You'd be sitting <laughs> there trying to play cards over and over and over again. No, cause one of the things that is the defense, I have to make sure, well, I'm going to sacrifice, let him lock these, but I got to make sure I just keep one on my side. So you have to figure that out and playing the cards very strategic in nature as to, do I hold on to this? Do I put this down in front of me as my evidence? What's interesting though, is like you said, there may be times when there may be a witness out there and you just say, you know what? I'm going to let the other side win. I don't have the really right cards in play. I'm just going to let him take this witness and I'll, I'll go for the next one. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there is that constant. It's like, well, you're not going to win every one. So you got to got to decide which one you're going to come out like, like on Watergate, Tony, as you're playing Watergate, there are just some points in that time on your game. It's like, you know what? I'm just going to let him have, uh, I think influence is something on a term over there too. I'm just gonna let him have the influence this turn, or I'm going to let him have first player this turn. I'm just not going to worry about it. And it's that same sort of thing. So I'm not sure the status of this game, uh, when it's going to be coming out again, that was kind of introduced to Essen. We got the prototype 
For a two-player game, thematically it works really well. Oh, by the way, each of you have objection tokens during the course of the game. If if Tony was to play a card, it was like, holy cow, that really swung this in a bad direction. I can play an objection token to make him discard that card, but you only have three per game, so you got to be careful to use the objections just at the right time. Yeah, it's like throwing the red flag on the field for you sports ball fans out there. <laughs> Challenge the play. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it'll be, uh, I can't wait to see when this game comes out. And you mentioned Watergate. Yeah. Rebecca still has my copy. I'm never getting that game back. I got uh, my copy back from a friend who had uh, borrowed it and he really enjoyed it. So if you ever want to play, I, I do have uh, my copy back. Yeah. She played it with her boyfriend and she won and uh, she doesn't get to give it back until he wins. So I'm like, good luck with that. <laughs> The Broken Token is the place you want to go if you are looking for fantastic game inserts and organizers. For example, their just released Arkham Horror 2nd Edition organizer, or maybe their Marvel Champions organizer, which fits everything nicely into one box. But there's something else I want to tease because Greg Spence, who is the president of The Broken Token, has also have a passion for holiday Christmas lights, automated holiday Christmas lights, which you've probably seen somewhere in some neighborhood around you. He has a passion for that hobby and it's actually just launched a brand new website where he's going to start selling products for that hobby called pixelworkshop.com. P-I-X-E-L workshop, but there's two P's and an E at the end. And what he's doing is he's taking what he's learned from manufacturing with inserts and applying that towards being able to create products for home automation for the holiday lights for hanging lights and showing lights and routing cables and everything like that. So if that's something you're interested in. Or if you're not, you just want to see how all this stuff works, you can check out pixelworkshop.com. Or if you're looking for amazing game inserts, then check out thebrokentoken.com. Tony, I don't know how this guy gets any sleep. I don't either, but he had an amazing light show over Christmas. I hope you got to check it out on YouTube. Five minute initiative begins in three, two, one. There's a really popular trend right now, Tony, of taking older games, kind of tweaking them a little bit and re-releasing them. And that's what Stronghold Games has recently done with a Gizia Shifting Sands, which uh, you and I just got to play recently. When we played Francis Drake, I said, what a cool concept of moving down the river to not being able to go back and place workers. I thought that was really cool. And everybody says, well, you all need to play a Gizia because that has that same concept. If you really like Francis Drake, then you're going to really enjoy a Gizia. So I was excited when Fred picked up his Kickstarter copy when it got delivered to him. It's an Egyptian themed game. And each of you have player boards and you have ships that you're going to place. Your ships are effectively workers and you start at the northern part of the Nile and you can start placing your ships in order to do different things, such as you might claim cards that will help give you additional resources, such as stone is what you're going to need to be able to pay for things, or maybe wheat, which is what you're going to need to feed your workers later on down in the phase, or you go out and start building things. And that's where you earn your victory points, Tony. You can go into a port and maybe you want to add stone to build or make statues which also generate victory points but Tony like you said you can't go backwards and that's the interesting part of this game as you start moving down each of you are going to pick a spot that you go to and then you have to leapfrog over everybody else and keep going down the path so Tony you got to make that decision well boy that card down there I really really could use so I'm going to jump all the way down there but by doing that you're leaving a lot of space behind you that everybody else is going to be able to, to gather and you just missed it all now Marty one of the things about this game that whenever I hear this in a game feeding people kind of turns me off in a game but for this one I you know I didn't have an issue with it as much as I thought I would did you no I didn't and I'm not a big fan of that either and the, the way you have to feed people is at the beginning of the game you have uh, basically five workers that are like they have strengths you have like a, a four strength one and one strength two and he's purple he's kind of like the leader of the wild and when you go to do an activity you must spend one of your workers and the worker must equal the strength of the activity you're trying to do so say for example that you want to add a stone to the obelisk and at the current level you're going to need four stone well that means you need to have a worker of strength four in order to be able to do so if you don't 
you can use your purple worker and add the two together in order to try to exceed that four. But every time you take an action, every time you build something at the statues, the pyramid, the colonnade, the obelisk, if you want to draw sphinx cards that are used for in-game scoring, you're going to have to spend stone and strength the workers to do so. After everybody has played their stuff, you're going to generate stone based on some cards that you've earned over the course of the game. And at that point, you have to look at add up all the strength of your workers and then feed them. So you have to look at how much grain or wheat that you generate. And again, that's done by card plays that you gather over the course of the game. If you exceed the strength, good. Everybody's fed. Great. If not, well, guess what? It's going to cost you some victory points. But Tony, I didn't have much of an issue with it either. I, I It's again, it's one of those things that's tense. You got to think about, oh boy, I need to make sure to go take this action to move up in the grain market so that I can make sure I can earn some extra grain. Or maybe I need some stone. I'm going to move up and take this action with my boat, move up in the stone market to generate some extra stone. There's not a lot of resources there, but it's just managing that's the trick. You Yes, you've got to be always forward thinking. How am I going to do this? You even have to think into the next round believe it or not even after this round clears what do i need to achieve next time what did i fail i tell you this was a game i'm excited to get back on the table just based on how poorly i played it i did not get that concept of the additional worker and putting the strengths together i don't know if i was sleeping through the rules or whatever maybe i was just one of those things that you know it did not click with me so i'm excited to try it again how the fields produce grain that was an important concept getting victory point cards all that comes into play for me marty i enjoyed playing the game i thought it was a solid game i'm glad we got to play it it's been too long since i played francis drake so i can't compare the two in my mind but you know for me either one put them on the table i love that mechanic of having that hard choice of being go down move forward you can never look back and this game plays up to four players and it plays in five rounds probably takes about an hour and a half to once you know the rules and there's a lot of variability in it because each round brand new cards are going to be coming out that uh in different orders and also a little action disc where you can put your boat on will come out in different order every round so every round feels different and at the very end of the game you're going to start adding up all those points you used and creating buildings and did you did you match the achievements required when you built those statues which is also random each game and then you have your end of the game victory point cards add all those up person the most points wins and tony for an old school euro game i really enjoy this too it didn't have a lot of flash or dazzle or anything unique it's an older game reprinted it feels good playing it i mentioned this on a previous episode it's like you know falling into a warm comfortable bed it's just all nice and cozy and you know what to expect that's a geezia shifting sand currently out from stronghold games five minute initiative is complete So if you've listened to Rolling Dice and Taking Names in the past, and if you're just now joining us, I need to make sure you understand one thing. I enjoy train games. Don't know why, but I enjoy a train game. I enjoy Railways of the World. I enjoy Strike. Wait, that's not a train <laughs> game, is it, Marty? Did, hey, Marty, did you see where Strike is getting re-released? I did, Tony. Um, I can't believe we didn't mention that in the uh, intro. Harry Potter Strike is coming, and we've already been in discussions with Ravensburger about maybe doing something special for our Strike event at Gen Con. So, yes, we're excited about that. But uh, you know what? I'm here to talk about a train game. We got on the table Age of Steam. I was so excited to get this on the table. Another reason I was so excited was because I said, guys, let me teach y'all Age of Steam. And you know, when I teach a game, it's usually met with groans and grunts and kind of like, really? Did Rodney do it? Rodney Smith do a video of this? And I said, don't worry about it, guys. This is not a hard game to learn. So what we're going to do here at Rolling Dice and Taking Names, since I love trains so much, is we're going to periodically talk about some train games that are coming to the table. Marty's never played Railways of the World. Mm -mm. And in fact, uh, Tony has been really wanting to play a lot of these games. I realized, you know what? This genre of games, this theme of games is so prevalent in this hobby. I mean, there, there's more... Mm -hmm 
train games than you can shake a stick at. I mean, there is it's a whole subgenre in itself. After all these years, I feel like, you know, I should dive into it. Tony really is really into it. So that's what side we're going to do. We're going to every so often play a train game. Eventually it will be where I raise of the world. And we're going to uh, basically have a train segment on the show. And one of the first ones we decided to do was Age of Steam. One of the reasons why is because we're big fans of the designer uh, Martin Wallace. And I've heard a lot of great things about it. So I wanted to see what it was all about myself. And this was the Age of Steam Deluxe. This was the re-release from um, Eagle Griffin. Mm -hmm. Now there's some controversy surrounding the design and designer and the credits and things like that. We're not here to discuss that. We're here to discuss a train game. Yes. If you want to read all the drama behind that, just go search on BGG. It's it, it's all there. There's a lot going on. We're not going to get into that. We just want to talk about the game itself. Everybody's sitting there thinking, now you don't like long games. I mean, that's a true, that's a true statement, but something about the train games, I don't mind them being long. Now I'll admit I cannot do a six hour train game, but this mm. one's right there in the sweet spot for me, Marty. I enjoyed the length of this game. Yeah. Let's see. Our first play took us couple hours, two to three hours, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't too bad, but it's one of those things that once you know, then our, then the, the gameplays after that are much shorter. And from my standpoint, we sometimes confuse the stock market type games that involve trains with the rail lane type train game. Right. And that's, I think that's a good dis distinction because I, I immediately think of the, the stock type thing where I'm owning stock and different railways. And this one is probably more there is stock involved, but there's more rail laying and then goods moving transportation. I mean, the whole concept is you need to generate money to pay for your locomotive. And the way you do that is by delivering goods across the railways. And so you're sitting there trying to think, how am I going to generate the income for my trains, for my locomotive, for my industry? that will enable me to keep building upon that, to keep generating income. Because at the end of the game, does money matter in this game, Marty? I don't think it does, does it? That is what's so crazy to me about this game. The thing about this game, I've heard people were talking to us afterwards saying, so how was that managing the money? Because it seems like you're always running short. At the beginning, uh, you're gonna issue shares of stock, and every time you do, you get money for that. And you use that in order to bid for player order, you use it for building your tracks, but then you have to move your goods and that's how you get money in return. And at the end, you have to pay your expenses. And if you don't have enough money to pay your expenses, you are in a world of hurt. So money was so important at this game that I was stunned that in the end, it doesn't matter at all how much money you have left over. No. And, and so you're sitting there thinking, oh man, I don't have to worry about that. But you have to plan so far in advance in this game. Boy, you do. So one of the first things you have to do, and the reason why you got to do that is you've got to take out bonds on your railroad, right? You got to be able to say, how am I going to get some extra money during my turn, during my turn? So you've got to decide how much money am I going to need at the end of this? So then that's the, that's that issue shares. So you issue just got to decide shares. right then and there, Hey, how many shares you're going to issue and you're going to get $5 per share. And Tony, if you want, you could generate five shares if you want for $25, not smart, but you could. <laughs> and why, and why is that not smart, Marty? Because at the end of the game, what happens with all those shares you generated? They become negative points. And that's another thing you got to think about too. You got to balance that. If you say, well, I'm just going to generate tons of shares. Well, in the end, you're going to have to pay the piper because each of those shares is, is costing you negative three victory points at the end of the game. Consider that as a lesson learned when you get to the end and you're like, man, I should have taken out an additional share. <laughs> that's right so i love how this game is played over phases tony mm -hmm. uh the, the i love how the boards are laid out and they basically just walk you through a sequence one through ten here's the next ten things that you're going to do and i love phased based games like this because we can start at the top okay first thing we're going to do we're going to issue shares everybody decides how many shares they're going to take you're going to collect your money and then comes player order, which is also extremely important and includes a bidding mechanic with one of the most interesting bidding resolution mechanics I've ever seen. Why is it so interesting to you? What concept of the person who wants to be first has to pay full price? Person who wants to be second has got to pay full price. Then the next people 
have to pay half price and the last person doesn't have to pay squat. It's that half price and zero price. Because as you're bidding, you're thinking, I don't want somebody to get something cheap. And if you bid, if somebody jumps out or passes right after you, it's like, great. Well, now it's going to cost me some money, at least half. And then you hope somebody else doesn't pass. It's like, well, great. Now I'm going to have to pay full price and may not even get the first selection. Mm -hmm. This is an extremely an important part of the game, an important phase. And there's another version of this game called Steam Tony. Mm -hmm. And I have not played it, but I asked people, uh, what's the difference between the two? And it's in this determined player order right here that's different. But I think I like this bidding mechanic of Age of Steam that I would always want to play it this way. And you have to be careful with those bids because remember when you issued shares? And if you're scared, happy and you really got to go first and somebody drives up your bid when you get to the end... <laughs> of that phase of that round oh that that can hurt you because you don't have enough money once again a lot of thinking a lot of contemplation just even going on bidding for who gets to go first yeah but that's extremely important because yeah. then the next action is selecting your actions you've got seven actions that you can select and if you're first player you get to choose any of them and some of these are super good moving your goods first might be important building the uh, track first could be important. If you're going to be an engineer, which we've already talked about, and this is the engineer I thought when my dad said you should be an engineer, to be able you know, run a train, here you get to place four tracks. Yep. Which you're like, why is that so important? Well, you may need to be able to lay four tiles to reach from one destination to the next. Moving your locomotive disc, which basically is how far you can travel with your locomotive, which is extremely important. You can do it right here for free instead of waiting later on and, and taking an action to do it. Then you have the urbanization, which allows you to put a town on the board. Extremely important too that we found out over the course of the game. And then there's productions because there are certain goods that are going to be moving around the board. And as those goods are removed or moved from the board, they're not replaced. And this is where that happens because you draw cubes out of the board and you get to put them where they're going to be placed on the board in a future action based upon a dice roll. And then the last one, Tony, did anybody ever even do the turn order pass, which allows you to pass during a bid? Nobody took it, but we were playing with four players. Now I can see where this action, it may seem like not such a great action, but by passing, normally if you pass in the auction to determine who goes first or second or third, you're out. You, you end up in the last spot or wherever. This may force the other players to up their bid. And you can sit there and say, well, without me actually committing to anything, I could end up third or second. Yeah. So th there's, there is value in that. And I bet with a six player game, but I could see where that would be a huge advantage to take that, especially in the later rounds where money is so important. And then we move into the building track phase. And this is where you're going to take hex tiles with track configurations on and put them on a board and actually start building out your track. You can place up to three track. Again, you're going to go in player order. And right when you start the game, you must start at the city because this is a big hex tile board that has different cities. And Tony, have you looked at the number of maps that are available for Age of Steam? It's ridiculous. It is. And we've got plenty to try out. I'm excited for them. They even have variations for two to three players. I'm excited for that. So you're going to have to start building track from a city and you're trying to connect from one city to another. Each of those cities are pre-populated at the beginning of the game with colored cubes. And you're trying to move those color of cubes to the city that has a corresponding same color. And so you're trying to build those tracks. It's like, well, let's see, this is a blue cube on this city. There's a blue city over there. I'm going to try to construct a track over there because I know these blue cubes need to get over there. So you kind of start out with the goal, but you know, one of the actions, Tony, that we talked about adding new cities to the board. So as you play the game, more cities tiles come out, which will have goods produced on them, which means I'll be need to have tracks connected to them. It starts getting crazy. And it's also important to know that even when you build a track and end it in a city, that's a segment. So you, you, you've completed it. So that's some victory points at the end of the game. So that's why this is so important. Also, it's very important that when you're doing that, that you realize, Hmm, if I run it this way, maybe I can create issues for the other players. Mm -hmm. You can never completely hurt hurt players, but you can force them to reroute or spend additional money to play tracks. So all that's important. Like you said, when you're running those cubes across there, the more places you run a cube through, the number of cities you run a cube through, 
That is victory points for you at the end. And here, Tony, is where a lot of the math comes in that you probably did at the beginning of the phase because you realize, okay, on this turn, I want to try to build this track. I want to try to connect these two cities. Different tracks have different costs. The really simple tracks, the straight tracks, a simple curve have a cost of two unless you're placing it. Uh, in a river, then it's going to cost three. If you have to go through a mountain, it costs four. But then the tracks get more complex. They crisscross each other. There's bridges. And those have an even higher additional cost of like four bucks, et cetera. So you, as at the beginning of the phase, you think, okay, crap. Well, I need to take out this many shares. I got to make sure not to overbid on this because I got to make sure I save enough money. I need the, gosh, I need like, what, $9 in order to put down three simple tracks to get these two connected. And all this is going through in your mind right in that first phase. You've completed your tracks. Life is good. Now it's time to actually move the goods. Yay! So in player order, you may move one good cube from one town to another town, provided your locomotive has enough strength. You could have a track that runs from one end of the board all the way to the next. As long as it doesn't touch another city, that's considered one strength locomotive. Seems kind of odd, Marty. It's not counting the number of hexagon track tiles. Mm -hmm. It's like you said, the segments between cities that you're counting as a strength. If you don't have enough, then you cannot just move the good part of the way. Nope. It doesn't work that way. The train's got to go all the way to the end. <laughs> so that's another action you can take in moving good is increasing the strength of your locomotive. But you really need to move the goods because you need to get the money. Mm -hmm. And this is where I was talking about earlier. You can do two of these. You can move two goods. You know, you can increase your uh, locomotive and then move a good. That's why that action way back in an earlier phase where it allows, allows me to go ahead and increase my locomotive strength right there. That means when I get to this point, then I can use my two actions during this turn to move two goods. I'm having to calculate way in advance how what goods I'm going to move. And if someone moves a good before me, oh. that's really going to make me mad. <laughs> also, I can, if my railroad is strength, I don't have to just stick to the tracks I own. Mm -hmm. I can use other people's tracks, but if I do, when I use their tracks, they get a plus one or a plus two, depends on how many, how many segments or uh, tracks I use of theirs. So you have to consider all that, but sometimes it may be a benefit to do that so that you can position yourself because you may not be able to move any other goods. All that's going through your mind. That's in the move good phase. Mm -hmm. Then as you move up, it's time, Marty. And now if you want to say something about move goods, go ahead. You can say it because we're going to collect some income. That's right. Because as you move those goods, you're going to move up on the income track. And that's what's important because now you're going to look at the track and go, okay, how much money do I get at this point? And then you're going to collect that amount of money because Tony, it's time to pay the piper in phase number seven. You've got to pay your expenses. You got to pay one buck for every share that you've issued plus one for every link strength that their locomotives can traverse. So you'll think, hey, I'm just going to increase my locomotive to six. Well, guess what, buddy? You better have six bucks available at, the, at this point in time so that you can pay that back. So you pay out all your expenses. You've taken that into account. You figured out, oh my heavens, this is going to hurt at the end. So now you're like, okay, are we done? Well, almost. <laughs> because you remember how we've been talking about how important money is and how you need to get that income. Well, the more income that you get on the income track, at a certain point, you're going to have to start having an income reduction. Thematically, Tony, I'm not sure why there's an income reduction. Hey, hey, I can tell you right now. Tell me. I've got two scenarios for this. The first one is you're having to pay federal government. Okay. You've got taxes or maybe you've got to, oh, I don't know, slide a little bit under the table to the union, or maybe there's something else going on that you need to, you know, get a right away and you need to pay some landowners off and not tell anybody about it. Yep. So, so you, so you got to do a little reduction there that, that, that came off the top <laughs> that we don't want the accountants to show. So there you had a little income reduction and it's a progressive sort of thing. So if your income's between 11 and 20, then your income drops back to, and it goes up to, you know, if your income's over 49, it's going to reduce 10. So it's another thing you got to think of Tony. Lots of times we were realizing, boy, I don't want to break that next threshold for the income track because I would have to cause it costs me additional two income if I do that. But wait, Marty, 
Remember what I just said about moving across other people's tracks? You can force them to go up. Ah, that's true. And we did that in this game, didn't we? So if you see that your buddy over there is sitting right there at all oh, the threshold, if he moves up one more, he's going to reduce because it is a hard progression. You can just force him into the next level and bam, you could hurt him. So there is a little take that to that game. And then finally, there's a goods growth. You're going to take, yes, there's actually dice in this game, but it's not dice luck think, that you might think it would be. You're going to roll a couple dice. And at the beginning of the game, there was a, a goods area on the board that was pre-populated with some goods. And based on the dice roll, like if it's a three or a six or whatever, you're going to take a cube from the three area, put it on the three city. There's a light city and dark city. It's, they kind of break it up two ways. And then, uh, like you take the result of the other die, maybe it was five. You'll take a cube from the five column and place it on the city that has the number five. And Tony, those don't get replaced. Unless there's an action that does it. Which there is. And that was one of the actions that you could select at the beginning where you pull cubes out of the bag and replace those. So some cities will never, ever get repopulated with goods unless somebody takes that action to put more goods out. Again, another thing that you got to decide if you got a city that's not doing anything, then you might want to select that action earlier on in the round to let you pull at some additional goods and, and put it on that city of your choice. Right. And hope they're the right color. Hope that they will work for you. Oh yep. man. Get to the end. We're at phase 10, advance the turn marker to the next round. The rounds, depending on how many players you have, will determine how long the game goes. Rinse and repeat. There you go again. Start calculating. Start thinking, what do you want to do? Start going after each other again to become the best railroad person in your gaming group. Marty, your first time playing Age of Steam, you looked at me and said, yep, this is good. We're going to play this again. Yeah, this is good. But what was really interesting too, when we started calculating the, the victory points, so you mentioned you lose three victory points for every share that you issued. You mentioned that, but you receive three victory points for every dollar of income shown on the income track. So it's kind of a balancing thing. If you can get your income up, you might be able to afford to issue another share or two because they'll balance each other out. If you can jump ahead of one on the income track, you might end up gaining an extra three instead of instead of losing three so at the very end money means nothing like we said you add up all the points that you generate from the income track subtract points some stocks that you issued person with the most points wins that's right add in how many tracks you got because that's how you beat me you built more tracks than me and it was like only by, by one it was super close mm -hmm. yeah after this game tony i was like this was good this was good because you always think of train games just very dry and people may be hearing this boy this does sound dry <laughs> no or is it because we talked about it? it it may be because we talked about it i mean that's very true but the, the whole income thing man i mean everybody on that first phase of how much stock are you going to issue everybody's doing a lot of math in their head at that point I need to issue this amount of tracks. So I'm going to be able to do this. That means I can move these goods. That means I got a link strength of this. So if I can move those five, that'll give me five. Push out that five on the income, which means I'm giving me. I mean, in, it's just running right through your head this whole time. And if you screw up, and this and there's that time when you got to pay your income, and you don't have it. It's going to cost you victory points. And theoretically, Tony, you could lose enough victory points to where you're out of the game. Yes. And if you are eliminated, that's it. You can sit there and watch, go get nuts, whatever, go get more drinks for everybody. You're done. I am ready to play this on more maps, man. You say you got more maps for us to try out. Oh, I got some more maps for us to try out. I'm excited for it, but I also have railways of the world. We got to get on the table so you can try that out. Now I was going through some of the maps and there is one called Barbados and it is a solo rule game or solo game created by Ted Allspock. I don't know if you know him. Yes. He said, well, who is he? He is the head of Bezier Games. There you go. Uh, who you may know for Werewolf and all that line of games. So you got a solo game. Try to do the best you can out there. So that's kind of interesting. I hadn't thought of that. So yes, I've got a ton of maps. I can't wait to play. So this one is staying on the shelves for me. I really enjoyed it. Can't wait to compare it to Railways. I even have Steam. So we'll be able to compare those. And so it's like I said, Steam, uh, Martin Wallace. This is by um, some Eagle Griffin Games. And Age of Steam is created by Join Boyer. And again, it's one of those things that this is where some of the drama comes in, but this particular version is created by John Boyer, published by Eagle Griffin Games, and the art and designs by Ian O'Toole. 
uh, who you may know is doing a lot of different games. In fact, he's doing a lot of train games right now, Tony, because uh, the Capstone game series, the Irish mm -hmm. Gage, etc. He's doing all that. So there's a lot of commonality between the art styles of these train games, which I actually kind of like. I'm impressed that Ian can draw all straight lines. <laughs> My train tracks would never look that good. Well, it's not that. It's the color, right? It's the iconography. It's 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 the way the colors look and everything. It doesn't look bland. It's amazing how you can take simple hexes and turn them into something colorful and that's pleasant to look at. And and uh, Ian O'Toole has done that here. In our last episode, Marty and I were so excited about the announcements at PortalCon that we could not tell you and keep our excitement in. We couldn't tell you what was coming out because we were just so excited about everything that Ignacy had announced. We were just astounded by this. And right now, if you go over to PortalGamesUS.com, you could get your pre-order to the new expansion to Empires of the North. That's right. The pre Romans. Today. Roman banners get 20% off discount right now. Head over to Portal Games US and check that out. Marty, what else did the man announce at PortalCon? That's Ignacy, by the way. Empires of the North is in the Imperial Settlers world, and Imperial Settlers is coming out with a new campaign type game. Tony, did you see that? Yes, I did. Yes, I thought that was interesting. But the one thing that I saw that I knew Tony's going to be super excited about is the Robinson Crusoe scenario book Ooh, that's going so to be coming to Kickstarter. Basically, it's just a book. It's a book with different scenarios where you just flip through, pick a scenario, and you want to play it. I thought that was a brilliant idea, Tony. So it's not a boxed expansion. It's just a hardbound book that you can pull off the shelf, flip to it, set up a game, and you're off and running with the base game of Robinson Crusoe. Yeah, and after that beatdown we got in the last expansion, I'm going to prefer the scenarios, I think. <laughs> <laughs> going insane on that island was not a good play for me. Oh, that game just wore me out. And also, he announced a secret game that he can't say much about, but it has to do with soccer or football, as they call it over there. So Tony's got a soccer game coming out. I'm so excited. Yay. I just hope he comes close to what he and I get to play at Gen Con. He actually asked, will his game replace what you guys play at Gen Con? He went, no, we'll still be playing that classic game. Okay. And what about Detective? Detective, the uh, season one is going to be coming out later on this year, which he had announced earlier, which is kind of like a simpler version of Detective. But there's also some new scenarios coming out for the full Detective, including the one from Rob Davia. So there you have it from PortalCon to PortalGamesUS.com. Go check them out. Tony, in the last show, we had this long discussion about what publishers have to deal with now in putting out games, what games are going to put out, what types of games. There's 3,000 games coming out per year. Games don't stay on the shelves long, which really got me thinking. Tony, with all those 3,000 games, I just want to ask you a, a question personally. So we're on the mailing list. We get a lot of different types of game announcements and everything. They're constantly coming out. We see stuff on BGG. With so many games coming out, what does it take to grab your interest right now? When it shows up on a page, you go, I'm interested in that as opposed to oh, another game and not even look at it. Uh, you know, I think for me, it's going to come down to, and I hate to say it, price point. Really? I did not realize that, but I mean, wait a minute, hold on. How, you've known me for how long? I know, I know I have, but I'm just saying that lots of times these games come out, you don't even know the price point yet. For example, we just talked about the Imperial Settlers like campaign style thing. No mm -hmm. idea on the price, but you were interested. So it is so is price the only thing that you would look at? Well, I mean, I think of it from the standpoint of, okay, I know that should not be more than this. So therefore, I will then go look at it. You see what I'm saying? Okay. If I, if I hear, oh, this game has a ton of miniatures, I know where that's going to be at. So that's kind of beyond what I'm willing to pay at this point. But, you know, maybe I'm being unfair. Yes, I always have buyer's remorse. Um, so from that standpoint, you know, should I go look at them? I probably should, but I guess maybe for me it is. It's, it's one of those things where is it based on the mechanics that I enjoy? Is it an expansion to a game? And that's also something else I think I'm looking at. Is it an expansion to a game that I already have? If it is, that will get my attention. Is it an, If it's a new game, hmm. How much is it going to cost me? Where Where is it going to come in? And how is it going to compete against the other games? So you're, you're almost looking for experiences to elevate or games that you already have or be able to provide something that'll 
pull a game off the shelf that maybe you hadn't played recently. Right. And it's, and as you've stated so eloquently is that, you know, developers are fighting for shelf space. How do they get it on that shelf? Well, that makes me think too. You, I mean, look at the two games that we talked about here. These aren't new games. They're basically reprints or remakes of older games. Age of Steam has been around for a very long time. Eagle Griffin Games just came out with, you know, the, the deluxe version. And that's the first time we'd ever played it. So we're experiencing an older game. Agizia was an older game that came out with a new version. That seems to be a trend that I'm starting to notice is that there's all these games that were really popular one time that may be hard to find or look dated or whatever. And they're reprinting those mm -hmm. and bringing those back for people to experience again. And that's one thing that actually draws me in, Tony. If there's a reprint of a game that I never got to play that I knew was hot at one time, I want to experience it like I just did with Age of Steam. Okay, so I'm going to go back and say also on a theme that maybe isn't very prevalent. So mm -hmm. like when Honey Buzz hit, there was other B games, but nothing was being produced as well as Honey Buzz. And then suddenly, all right, now there's all these other B games coming. What? What's going on here? And it's so funny when it comes to theme, I am really weird and I need to get out of this mind space of theme does not draw me in at all. There's rarely a game that comes out where I go, Ooh, based on the theme, I want to check that out. But, but many times a theme will turn me off. Okay. Themes don't draw me in but they may push me away and that's a horrible way to look at things because there are things that I miss because I didn't think the theme was that great. And let me give you a prime example about this time last year, wingspan came out. Wingspan is a very colorful game with birds and feeding birds and eggs and making eggs. And I had zero interest in it. It's a game on birds. I just have zero interest in that. <laughs> Meanwhile, everybody was going crazy over it. So when I went, okay, well, there's obviously something to it. So I sit down and played it and went, oh, okay. I should not have dismissed this game strictly on theme because it's a solid, you know, little Euro game. Mm -hmm. But I find that I'm that way a lot, especially if it's an IP based game. Because I've had such bad experiences in the past with like video games based on movies or comic books where they're not good. And now I kind of assume that here too. That's one thing I need to change. Theme doesn't draw me in, but theme turns me off. Maybe we are sitting there looking at what's flashy too. Uh, you know, you've raised a good question. I need to probably go back and think more about it. I know you put it in the show notes and I, I kind did. of glossed so over it. You could it. think about it before we talked about it. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, and I kind of sort of maybe not did. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm, I'm pretty sad in my collection. I will say that. I'm happy with what's in my collection now. But then again, I go out. And, and what drives me to buy a new game? Yes, what? That's what I'm asking you. So you still buy new games, a, a removing price point. So is it strictly um, expansion? Is it, is it who makes it? That's one thing that drives me in. If, if, it's a, if it's a designer that I like, I am super interested because, for example, Plan B has a game coming out from the designer who did Coimbra, and we love that game. I'm like, yes, I'm interested. I don't know anything about it. But designers now pull me in because of stuff they've done in the past that I've enjoyed. Mm -hmm. oh, I agree with that. But so for me, what puts a new game on my shelf? I bought Lincoln. It was half price. <laughs> so it still comes down to money. Yeah. The, uh, the daily deal. I mean, you know, um, miniature market is running these incredible deals on some uh, uh, Asmodee games, right? FFG games, Asmodee games. I mean, Lahar was out there and sold out in no time. What was it like $25 or something? Yeah. You know, why would I pick up such an old game? Well, one, it's a great game. Two, it's definitely at a great price point. Again, I think of things that grab my interest. One is a designer of something that I've played in the past that I've enjoyed. It is a nostalgia of games that maybe I missed that I want to try again. And I guess probably the last thing is some interesting mechanic that I think is cool but I think that is getting harder and harder to happen personally for me. Used to be, I'd read something and go, I have never seen that before. I want to try that. But as time goes on, usually things are just tweaks of something I've already tried to where the new mechanic thing is less 
of a decision maker for me now. I can understand that. And see, for me, mechanics is all that drives it. I know I like deck builders. I know I like dice. But there's just tons of deck builders. How would you decide between this deck builder and that deck builder? Once again, <laughs> what's the price? When I look at a game, I mean, you know, we bought Marvel Champions, right? Yep. So there's the theme. That's got me in. Are you influenced by other people and what they say about a game? Well, you. Yeah, you you guilt me into everything. Well... I guess that's true somewhat. We used to kid about that. No, it is. I They used to call me. Can't use the word, but anyway. <laughs> well, it used to, we don't say it anymore, but I used to be, they used to call me the game pimp because yeah. I was always, or maybe the game dealer, like a drug dealer, because yeah. I was always pushing games on exactly. people. Hey, don't you want to try this game? Hey, don't you want to try this game? Yeah, it was definitely more of a game dealer than anything else. Oh, look at that game. It's got similar mechanics as Android Netrunner. We need to give this a try. Oh, look, it's Arkham Horror. You need to go with this game. Oh, yeah. Okay, fine. Whatever. Just let me play a game see if I enjoy it. I mean, I don't, I don't need a lot of flash. I mean, when I look at the Age of Steam Deluxe version that we just played, from that standpoint, there's not a lot of flash to it. Mm -mm. Solid mechanics, solid concepts concepts that i enjoy speaking of age of steam and eagle griffin games they're getting ready to come out with rococo the deluxe version again mm -hmm. a game i heard a lot about never played i'm interested to try it exactly um then we look at a new flash in the pan masters of renaissance lorenzo el magnifico the card game wow why what would make me jump on that well that was just simply just the name lorenzo yeah, exactly. So it was funny. We were picking on that name last episode, but we may have never played if it didn't have that name in it. And come to find out, we really enjoyed the game. Mm -hmm. But if it had just been called Masters of Renaissance, we probably would have never picked it up. You are absolutely right. That's kind of sad. Again, it's just one of those things. I don't know. I was just thinking about it. It's like with all these games now, what influences your decision to take up a spot on your shelf? So it sounds like money is a driving factor for you. And I think oh, yeah. it comes down to pedigree. Is it an established game that I haven't tried before? And and I guess the designer. It's kind of like, you know, when movies come out now, I'm wondering who directed it and who wrote it. That's kind of what I'm really interested in. Then I might be interested in it. It's kind of the same way with games now. And say for a movie, it's like, is that going to entertain me? How would you know? What do you base that on? Do you base it on an actor? Do you base it on theme? Theme. Do you base it on cost because you have a movie pass and you get in cheap? I, I will admit <laughs> <laughs> that Tuesday $5 movies, I have seen more movies because of that. Sure. And if I were to have gone on a Friday or Saturday night, I would not have paid that money to take the chance on a Quentin Tarantino film. Sure. So there you go. Oh, did you go see Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? I did. Did you like it? Yes, I did. You did. I would have thought you would not have liked that movie. And there's a reason why I liked it. Two actors. Oh, with Brad Pitt and uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, huh? Uh, yes. Because Margot Robbie didn't say a thing. She didn't say a thing. The whole movie. She didn't say anything. Without spoilers or anything, wasn't the last 15 of that minutes of that movie amazing? I, yeah, I, that was worth it right there. I just enjoyed the whole concept of how he was taking the history behind it. That that was just amazing. Well, I'm, all I'm going to do is, is this. And if you've seen the movie, you'll get this. <laughs> you got uh, it, didn't you? <laughs> yep. So before we get out of here, Nintendo Switch yes. has announced, let it slip. Breath of the Wild 2 will be out in probably 2021. Oh, they did let it slip. I have not heard that. Some things have slipped. Now this could have just been the internet lying to me, which it probably was, but my Google feed was talking about breath of the wild looks to be a 2021 based on recent slips, slips of dates or like leaks, leaks, Thank leaks you. of screens. Yeah. So, and then Mario Kart nine looks to be the 2020 release. Really? And did you know they just released their financials last week? Mario Kart eight is the biggest selling game on the Switch. I believe it. It's amazing. I'm stunned. You know what number two is? Uh, would be Smash Brothers. It is. I still have not bought my Pokemon. And they've also announced too, not, no new versions of hardware will be coming out this year. So there's not going to be a Switch Pro, which I thought was interesting because with the new Xbox and PlayStation coming out, I thought they might be worried that it's going to be too underpowered now, but I guess they ain't too worried right now. Why should they be worried? All they need to do is say one word portability. I can't argue with that. That is the selling point of that console right now. Yes. Here's a grown 50 plus year old man who was lucky enough to be in first class flying to Orlando. And the guy beside him was over there playing his candy crush. And I 
Bring out the switch, baby. And you just put him to shame. It's like, I dude, did. let me show you how to game. This is a game right here. Don't, why don't you just go ahead and make your little donut over there? How close are you to finishing Breath of the Wild? I'm at the point now where I need to finish it because the enemies have upgraded so much. <laughs> but I'm at a point of, um, I really want to make this armor better. So I'm farming parts. Yeah. And it's not because I need to, it's because I want to. That's cool. That keeps you in the game like that. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, when you're done, do you know what you'll get next? Well, you know, I have Link's Awakening. You do have that. Yeah. So cool. I've got to get that played. I brought, oh, what was that deck building card game? That's what I played on the plane. The Slay whole time. the Spire. Yeah. What'd you think of that? I enjoyed it a lot. So you're okay with roguelike games? Yeah. Okay. Those frustrate me sometimes. Okay, a lot of times, but I'm okay with it with Slay the Spire for some reason. And then finally, um, I still got to, when I get back in the house, I'm going to do Ring, the uh, Ring Fit adventure. Ring Fit, yeah. Either way, I got to just keep rolling dice. And taking names. Thanks so much for listening. And if you want to, you can follow us on Twitter at Dyson Names, Instagram Dyson Names, Facebook page, Roll Dice Take Names, our BGG Guild 1589. We love iTunes reviews. So if you get a chance, please leave us a review on iTunes. It really helps. And we'll see you or we'll see, well, I guess we won't see you. You'll hear us next episode. Hey, Tony, I know you're heading over to do, uh, do some gaming. Uh, you want me to order a, a pizza for us? Yeah, can you go ahead and take care of that for us? And that way it'll be hot and ready when I get there. Yeah, hold on. I'm not sure what you want, but let me see if I can look up the number of my phone. I can't I can't see that too well. I, I think that's Domino's. Let me see. To be continued on the 200th episode of The Secret Cabal. <laughs>